What's up, church? How's everybody doing? No, oh, come on. This is the, the best crowd, the last crowd, the noon service. 11.45. It's afternoon now. Like, come on. We're partying all the way into the noon hour. Come on. So it's great to have you guys join us. Of course, we have our other locations and those that are watching online. Let's welcome the rest of our family. Good to have you with us. Yeah. And so, uh, as you can see, service is going to be a whole lot different. First of all, I'm excited to have Amy up here with me again. Y'all give it up for Amy. (laughs) So, uh, what we're doing today is concluding uh, a family values is the name of the series we've done. Amy and I kicked it off the first week talking about parenting and really investing in the next generation. If you miss that weekend, I encourage you guys to go and to listen, whether you're a parent, a grandparent, uh, you know, just a mentor, a foster parent, it it doesn't matter. Uh, We really made it as spiritual and practical as we could, just what do kids need and how can we invest in them? And so when we did that week, we actually surveyed our middle and high schoolers and we asked them this question, like, I wish my parents knew and then they filled in the blank. And if you were here, you got to hear from our own kids, our own middle schoolers and high schoolers, what's on their heart. And it was heavy. You could just see their desire and their crying out for, for help. And today, as we finish this series, Bernard last week did marriage. He did a phenomenal job. Y'all give it up for Pastor Bernard. Yeah, he did a great job. And so this week, we have been asking you for your questions, and you guys have been submitting them, and the same heart cry to God has been in these questions, and I'm telling you, it's been on our hearts, and so we're up here today as pastors, your leaders in in the church to help speak to that and to encourage you, and so today is going to be very practical, very biblical, but it's going to be very pointed because these are questions you were asking. We had so many questions, we can't get to all of them, all right? And uh, we're going to do as best as we can to get to many as we can. And you will also want to go back and watch the other services. All three of them are going to be archived because they're all, we answer different questions in every service because we wanted to cover as much as we could. So it's going to be a great resource for you to go back and to watch those. We have other resources as well. We have a, um, a whole page on our website for resources for parenting, grief, uh, marriage, all of those. In fact, I think we even have a QR code that we can throw up now. I think you guys can. So you'll want to scan that. It'll take you right to page. We are loaded with resources to help you when it comes to anything you're dealing with relationally in your family. So uh, you'll definitely want to scan that as well. So uh, what we're going to do today is answer as many of those questions as we can And from that perspective. So let me introduce you to our panel or let me let these guys introduce you. We got one way over here. No one knows who this is. Hey, everybody. I am Bernard, and I have the privilege of being the campus pastor here at the Lakewood Ranch uh, campus here, and I've uh, been married to Elizabeth for 27 years. This week, we yeah, celebrate our 27th anniversary, Bernard and, Liz. and uh, love, 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 love serving here Look at Bayside. how sassy that girl looks with those cowboy boots <laughs> on, man. Come on. That's just fire right there. That's all I got to say. Well, good morning, guys. I am Jessica Gilliard. My husband, Willie, and I have the privilege of uh, being campus pastors at our Fruitville campus. Give it up for Fruitville. We're so excited to be at Fruitville campus. And I'm excited to be joining you guys here today. But this is, um, you saw the picture, that's our family. We are a blended family. So y'all pray for me. I have an almost 20-year-old and almost 16-year-old. So lots of prayers. And Willie and I will be 14 years in a couple weeks. So super excited. Yeah. Willie needs to know how good he has it. For you to put up with that y'all for 14 remind him years. When y'all see him. I know you listen to Willie over in Fruitville. You blessed. All right. Uh, my name is Jordan Bazet, and if I look like a blend of the two to my right, that's because I am. All right. These are my parents. Um, and I am one of the youth pastors here. I oversee the youth at all campuses, and I have been married for five years to my amazing wife, Sable. And then we have an eight-month-old named Ruby. Uh, she's the best ever. I have the happiest baby and the best wife ever. So that's my life. Hey, everybody. My name is Luke. I'm the next-gen pastor here at Bayside. 
I get to work with the coolest people at Bayside, all the kids, the students, the young adults, the youth pastors, the kids pastors, all those people. Uh, me and my amazing wife, April, who's sitting over there this morning, uh, have two children. Mace is 11, our son, and our daughter is five years old. Her name is Ayla, and it has been uh, the blessing of our life to parent these two kids who we've uh, adopted. So happy to be here this morning. You're just a big kid yourself, though. I mean, really. Hey, man, you know, I'm trying to be mature up here this morning, okay? <laughs> that ain't I'm trying gonna to behave, and you sat me next to Jordan, so it's like, we're going we're gonna to get in some trouble, maybe. You guys are both going to get fired today if you don't watch it. Yeah. Hey, hey. All right, thanks. <laughs> okay, so we're going to jump right into questions, Amy. We're going to jump yeah, right one. in. So here is the first question. It is, how can you still create a close, healthy family for children to grow up? in when our culture has changed so much. Everyone has to work all the time just to make ends meet, and children spend so much time away from home. I'll speak to growing up, you know, our family, we are tight. Like, we are a close family. Still to this day, we're all, like, growing up, and we're we're hanging out, and we're close, and um, it's because in James 4.14, it tells us that time is fleeting, that it's a vapor. I mean, it goes so fast, right? And time is like money in the sense that if you do not do not tell it where to go, it will go anywhere. So we as a family growing up, we had to make sure to set aside, put it in the calendar, let everyone know we set aside time that we would all be spending together and we all knew that was gonna happen. Because if we do not set time aside, it will go anywhere and we will not spend much time as a family together because like we're all busy, like we're all busy all the time. But one of the most important things that we can do is set aside time with our family. So for instance, growing up, we had Monday fun day, all right? We were homeschooled in elementary school, kind of. We went to like a hybrid school and my dad and mom were off on Monday. So Monday fun day, we hung out as a family. Everybody knew that. Every Monday, we're all hanging out. And then When we were at dinner, right, dinner, we sat at the table. I know that's crazy, right? Like no one sits at the dining room table anymore. We sat at the table. No cell phones. No cell, like no phone. This was my dad's famous line. If the the phone will be ringing, I don't care if it's the president. I'm not answering it. It's family time. But that was true. Like the phone would, he'd he'd just let it ring to let us know, hey, y'all are more important right here. So Set aside time to spend with your family because if you're not setting it as t- time aside, you'll end up just watching Netflix, doing something else, going to sports, hanging out, separating, going in your own, r- own room, right? But set time aside. Let's all hang out together. It was so important growing up. And we up. covered some of this the first week talking about how do you have open conversations with your family? And we talked about how to do that, just simple questions and things you could do. That's week one. So I would encourage you to go back and Watch that. It's just tools, just things to get conversations going so you're not sitting there watching TV, but you're actually having family interaction and sharing hearts and lives. Gives you an opportunity to invest in their heart and their lives. Yeah. Yeah, like you can buy this thing called Table Topics, okay? And it's a a thing of questions, and it gives provoking questions and fun questions for you and your family to answer at the table because you're like, I don't know what to talk about. Pull up one of those and answer. My wife and I do it every time we sit down for dinner. It's really, it's great. Mm -hmm. Can I just add to just kind of like living and thinking about raising our children, the culture that we see around us and the world around us. Um, Just, I want to encourage us to be mindful of not raising our children up in fear. And what I mean by that is to be mindful of what the world is around, but that we're raising our kids in who Christ is and knowing what the word of God says, who they are in Christ as well. And so we don't want to raise them up to fear what's happening around us, right? We, we want to be able to educate our children ourselves and what God's word says about family, what God's word says about unity, what God's word says about who they are. And so I know it's important that my kids know what's going on in the world, but that's coming from me, not what the world says. And so not living in fear is so important. We don't want them living in fear. We want them standing outside, right? Standing up for themselves and, and, and being set apart because that's what the Bible says. 
We, Love it. You know, we always said, we don't live, we live in the world, but not of the world. And greater is he that is in me than it is in the world. And so making sure that your kids always live by that as well. And that's in front of them. So they know they can be stronger than the things around them. And they can not um, be overcome by that, but actually be a leader in that and a change agent in this world to the people around them as well. Yes. Like in the coaching season, we talked about calling them to live high. No, you're better than that. You're a leader. Come on, we're, we're BZs or whatever your name is. We, we live above and beyond those kind of things. And you call them, they will rise up to the occasion. So uh, you don't have to allow your kids, any of us, we don't have to be formed and fashioned by this world. You think about it, we live here on the Gulf. So you go fishing, you catch a fish in the salt water. They're living in a, uh, an environment that is plenty of sodium. But you cook the fish, and then what do you put on it? Salt, okay? So they're in it, but it's not getting in them. And that's how we have to live in this world and to teach our kids that. So, okay, uh, here's, here's another question. As one ages and you're married for 45 years, what would you suggest in keeping a spark in the love relationship? Hey, brown chicken, brown cow. Oh my gosh. I'll take a stab at that. Um, yeah, see if you can r- rescue me from I, what I, I just did. But I'm, no, not, I'm, I'm not near 45 years yet, but I will say this much. Um, whether it's 45 years or five years, um, you are connected to the creator. So allow that creativity to flow through you. Um, be willing to explore. I mean, when we get to heaven, you realize we're not just going to be sitting around just going, okay, what do we do next? Uh, we're going to be learning all that God is for eternity. Uh, there's so much in him. And, and so he has made us uh, very complex human beings. And so uh, as close as you think you are to your spouse, uh, I promise you there are things that you'll be learning about your spouse if you stay curious, stay creative, allow God to speak to that. Uh, there's some practical things that you can do uh, with that uh, as far as keeping the, 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 the spark lit. Um, you know, there's things, for instance, my wife and I, there's things that uh, 20 years ago may not move us the same way, but as we continue to grow, we start to learn different things even about ourselves. Uh, in my healing journey, uh, there's been things that uh, I wasn't healed from when we first got married, but now I'm healed. And so now I feel things that I didn't feel before and I'm more sensitive than I was before. And same with her, we start to grow. And so then we start to realize there was a part of me that wasn't really living when we first got married, but now I'm actually living. And so now I want to explore those things. I, you know, my, my quote unquote, my innocence, whatever the case may be, I start to realize that if I'm connected to the most creep, of being in the universe, why not allow that creativity to flow through me in my relationship with my wife? That's great. Now, I was going to say, first of all, way to go. Whoever's been married 45 years and still wanting to know how to keep a spark in your marriage. I think that is so awesome that you're still wanting to work on that. And I think it's also not just the big things like making sure you get away and making sure you get out of the norm of life, but also just the little things in your marriage. For me, unexpected moments when I'm not expecting him to show up or expecting a kiss in the kitchen or whatever it may be, those unexpected moments... (laughs) I knew it like that one. The spark starts in the (laughs) kitchen, baby. I mean, that can start a spark. And so it's little things. I think so many times we make it be such a big deal. You're still over there. Come on, babe. Get control. We got to go to the kitchen. I got some work to do, all right? Oh, I'm sorry, Jordan. I forgot he's sitting right here. I'm going to leave that pool. I'm just down to head out. Even married, they never get used to that. No. <laughs> anyway, so. Yeah, so I, I think it's important for, it, we, we kind of get comfortable. It, think about what you did in your relationship when you guys first started. You're still dating and all. Think of how, guys, let me speak to you. How much you wooed her in, pursuing her. You, you would write poetry. You don't do poetry. And, and now all of a sudden you've just gotten comfortable and you guys are in a mundane. We just sit down and watch TV and we eat dinner and we hardly talk. I would tell you, just try do new things. Just right. you can start a spark by trying something different and something new. And, 
and you're talking about a, a, a spark, you know, then you have to realize that when it comes to developing intimacy and closeness in your marriage, it, it isn't about the bedroom. It's everything. Right. And so by pursuing them, uh, it kind of, it helps that. So yeah, congratulations for even desiring that and wanting that. And so in 45 years, we just hit 30. We, we got we to keep the spark go. going. 15 more. Let's go. <laughs> All right, next question is, how do you go about blending families and raising up Christ-centered children when the co-parents are non-believers? Yeah, that's a complicated question, and we have a lot of blended families, so. Yeah, so I can talk to that a little bit. Um, You know, thankfully, I'm not on the end of the non-believer co-parents, but I can still speak to uh, co-parenting with with, um, a blended family, and you know, lots of prayer um, that's one of the things that we have to make sure that we go into any decision that we make on behalf of our family. Willie and I have to purpose ourselves to pray about those decisions first because, you know, we have to think about what, you know, the other um, families that are involved as well. And so it's important that we go, we seek after the Lord first and foremost, and that we are in unity. That's important um, that we remain in unity as a family unit. Because if we know that God had brought this family together and we believe that, you know, the family that we have is who God brought us, then we're going to purpose ourselves to be in unity because that's what God's called us yep. to do and yep. asked us of us. And so anytime we have decisions, parenting decisions, we're going to do that. And also honoring the co-parents and, and um, respecting. The thing is, we don't have control either with what goes on you know, outside of what we have established in our home. Um, but we do, ha- we do have the power of prayer. And so we make sure that our kids are prayed up and prayed out the door when they're going out the door, right? And the same thing, not even, I mean, just in the world in general, as they go out, we're praying over our kids. And so it's important that we aren't disrespecting the other parents that we're, you know, we, we, we don't talk about the other parents. We make sure that we stay in unity and that there's honor and there's respect because at the end of the day, we're raising our children, right, to be a husband and a parent one day. And so God was very clear to us and said, Jessica, they're my children before they were yours. And so that's important. That was like, okay, God. So ultimately at the end of the day, I'm not trusting anybody else. I'm trusting God. And God has their best interests at heart before even he could do more, you know, for them than I could ever even do alone. And so I'm trusting the Lord that says, you know what, I'm, I'm giving you this child to steward them in my ways. And so I'm going to do the best I can with that, with the co-parents along as well. Let me, yes, y'all give it up for Jessica. That's a great, great bunch of wisdom there. I want to remind you guys of the verse. Um, I, th- I think it's in, in Romans, in, uh, Paul says, uh, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And so, as far as it depends on you, in other words, you're not in control of what someone else says about you, the other parent about you, but you can control the peace that is in your own environment, in your own home, and I, I think that's important. I, I know that must be difficult, but you don't want to be the stirrer of those things of peace. You want to be the protector of peace. I have a good scripture. James 3.18 says, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. That's, that's, I mean, that right there tells us that we are to be peacemakers and that we're to sow that, um, that peace because then we, what we ripe is what's important in the end. What we harvest, sorry, what we harvest. Yep. Love it. Okay. So people also submitted video questions. And so we're going to throw to a video question. Take a look. I have a question about marriage and family. How do we teach our teens about the dangers of addiction and pornography and avoid having them addicted to the dangers of the dark web and uh, screens? How can we nourish our marriages after someone has been exposed to pornography at a young age? This- yeah, so this is a, this is a big one. Um, in the world we live in today, this stuff is so accessible. The Bible says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. So as parents, as pastors, as uh, shepherds of younger people, we've got to help them to do that. I'm going to read you guys a stat. I carry this stuff around with me all the time because this is so 
prevalent uh, in this day and age. We covered some of this at 12 Conference with our middle school students and our high school students, but 11 years old is the average age that kids are first exposed to pornography. Wow. That's the latest stat. Uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of sobering to think about. And then uh, 94% of children will see pornography by the age of 14. So this is planet Earth in 2023. That's where we live. And uh, it, it can be very daunting when you think about it. And we got to be cautious and help our kids to lock their phones down. And there are apps and there's software out there like Covenant Eyes and things like that that can help us do that. We got to be careful with who our kids are hanging out with because you could lock their phone down. And then a friend may show them something on their phone when they're at school or on the bus uh, and it's just so everywhere in the world we live in. You could be walking through the mall and there's things on on billboards that look like soft pornography, honestly. Is there it's such thing as crazy. like soft pornography you think is just all, I mean, it's yeah, stirring yeah. up. It's and that's the, the desire. It's the same heartstrings that's that are the, being pulled on, all these soul yeah, ties that, industry, that are being that's what they're trying to do. created. Yeah. And really, my encouragement to parents is this. We have to be proactive about it. I don't want to paint a doomsday picture, but the kids are going to run into this stuff at some point. Yeah. So it's so important that we're having open communication with our kids about this and teaching them that God designed sex. He has a plan for that, and it's actually a good thing. The world and the enemy would love to grab that and twist that up and distort it and mess with people's identities, and that's what's happening. So as parents and leaders and stuff, we really got to have open communication with kids about, about these things and teach them the truth of the, what, what the Word of God says about it. Yeah, that's really good. So, uh, I was, go ahead, Ben. Yeah, I, I, th- I know that there was another part of that uh, question that had to deal with the, the marriage and how do you heal when you're exposed to that. And having walked through that myself, experiencing sexual abuse as a child, being exposed to pornography, that there's a healing part of your journey that you go into. And I would say the, the, the number one key in my personal journey that I believe will help everybody is Romans 12, chapter 2, talks about this renewing of the mind. Um, you know, this, the, the first thing that you've got to understand is that this thing, uh, pornography, it is a spirit. It's f- from the pit of hell. It's yeah. literally a strategy of the enemy uh, to literally rewire God's purpose and design in the human being. And so once physically we start to partner with something that has taken our mind, for me, the imagery and all of these things would just poison my mind. And the only way to counter that is to renew it with the washing of the word of God. So I would begin to, it's not like that stuff goes away, but what happens is instead of being fixated on the struggle or what I'm missing, I began to confess what God's word says and that would renew my mind. I am loved. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I am a child of God. I begin to just allow the word of God to wash over me. And eventually what begins to happen is what I gaze upon became my number one priority. And that other thing that that the enemy tried to create was undone because this renewing of my mind. I, I, I looked at things differently. I looked at people differently. And now... I began to value and appreciate the gift of my wife that God had given me. And now I begin to confess the word of God over us, over our marriage, over who we are. And I'm not satisfied with any counterfeit because that's all porn is. It's just a counterfeit because I have the real thing. Yeah. 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 That's great. That's very helpful. I, I want to go back to some things that uh, Pastor Luke was talking about in regards to your, our children Look, church, we have to be vigilant. The Bible says that to be vigilant because the devil is like a roaring lion looking through for whom he may devour. And the devil in pornography, it is from the pits of hell, Pastor B, and it, it is of the devil. And I'm telling you, it's out to get your kids because if it gets them that early, then it has them the rest of their, their lives. So we have to be vigilant. I would tell you, Make sure you have software on your, your digital media at your house, computers, phones, tablets, what, wherever it is, because you can't afford to allow your kids to, to have free access to that. They're targeting your kids. 
They're targeting. You think, well, oh, they won't do that. Oh, yes, they, your kids won't, but they'll come after them. And uh, they can accidentally uh, happen upon it. So you need to put filters on there. You need to have your kids, if they are on social media, then make sure that it's a locked, a private account and you approve the friends that they follow or the ones that follow them. Because I'm telling you, the pornography industry, they will appear as somebody that's nothing and they'll start sliding into their DMs and sharing things with them. They're grooming your children. They're grooming our children in this nation and we have a responsibility to protect them. And you, you don't, whether it's foster parenting or, or blended families, you're not always in control of your kids when they're not with you. So you better control more who they are with. And so sleeping over at other people's houses, this is just how we did it. Our kids didn't do sleepovers. Nothing good happens from midnight to four in the morning. So if nothing good happens, then you're going to be in my house where everything good is happening at that time. We sleeping. That's what we doing. And, you know, I'm not saying that everybody else, they're bad people, but you just, you can't control the environment. And we're going to give an account to the protection that we provided for our kids one day. And you can't be more, you can't be vigilant, too vigilant in that situation. So I just want to encourage you guys in that. Let's protect our kids because the devil's coming at them and let's win it. Let's protect their hearts and their minds in Jesus name. Amen. Okay, here's, here's a question. So uh, this one is dealing more with, with singles. How can those who feel called to be single, can they accept their lot without feeling left out or oddly different? Oh, man. That, so when I hear that question, um, if you're asking that question, you may not be called because when you're called, there's a grace that comes to you to function and to walk in that call. So if you feel odd or indifferent, uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 begins to talk about really this gift of singleness. Um, really, you're, you're complete, you're whole as you're connected to him. But he began to explain why it's even better to be single because when you're married, you have other concerns, you have other worries, there are other responsibilities that you have. When you're single, you can serve God, you can serve your community, you can serve others, you can spend time doing things that are absolutely valuable. And I think the part that we allow to happen too often as a single person is we allow culture to tell us we're missing out on something. But when God calls you, you're not missing out. You're actually on the inside with the inside scoop. It gives you more time to stay connected to what is on the heart of God. So please don't see yourself as missing something. And if you're asking the question, um, man, how do I deal with this? Maybe you're not called and that's okay. Because Paul even said it, man, it's better to get married than to burn in lust, right? So if you don't have that grace upon you, don't say it's a call because it may not be a call. And if you just continue to walk with God, if it's not a call, he'll bring the right one to you, but you've got to be uh, more concerned about being connected with him and serving him. And then the other things will come to, into play. Yeah, that's so good. Anybody else have anything? I would just add to that too. I mean, God created us to be in community. So sometimes you may be called to be single, but maybe you're not in community and that's what you're missing as well. So make sure if you are single that you are still, you are still called to be part of the body of Christ. You are still called to be in community with other people. So make sure that you aren't just... Um, focused on being alone, but being community with other people. I just encourage you. Yeah, and God did say that in Genesis, it is not good for man to be alone. And that, yes, that can be solved in marriage, but I've seen people in marriage be alone, according to what the scripture is talking about. So you can be marriage in marriage or married and still be isolated. Right. You can be single and not be isolated. Right. And so God, in other words, God is a relational God. He doesn't want us to have interactions with him. He wants us to be relational with him right. uh, or transactions with him. He wants us to have relationship with him. And so we are in a relationship with God and he wants us to be relational with others as well. And that's why God is saying it's not good to be alone. So do life together. And please, at, at this church, I'm the pastor of this church. So if you go somewhere else, then, you know, listen to that pastor. But if you go here, 
I do not want you to be doing life in the loneliest bayou in Louisiana by yourself. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so please, I promise you, we're, we're better together. And so you can be single, unmarried, and be completely walking in all that God has for you because you're not alone. But you need to be around the, the right people. And you actually have the ability to serve more and be involved more in what God is doing because like, you know, Amy's so worried about me all the time. And so if she didn't have me, she could even do more. That is true. That is very true. <laughs> I'd have a lot more time on my hands. Because yeah. so. I'm extra. All right. <laughs> so is it normal for a son to battle with his father all the time? Yes. <laughs> that was Got quick, Lou. Well, you jumped on that question, <laughs> didn't you? Okay. I, I have an 11-year-old son and uh, love him. Love him to death. Uh, but, but somehow in his but. 11 years, <laughs> he's learned everything. He knows everything. He's learned way more than I have in 41 years. I'll tell him my age right now. Um, no, but seriously, it, at that age, that 10-year-old age, we call it the tween years these days. They're not so much a child, but they're not quite yet a teenager either. They, it, that's a cognitive point of development where they are beginning to challenge ideas and kind of develop their own identity, et cetera, et cetera. And that's okay. I think our jobs as parents and things like that is to help them to do that with honor and respect. So they can ask questions. They can have their own thoughts, but they need to be able to do that with honor and respect. And the Bible says, uh, I had a scripture over here. It says, fathers do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, there's times when my son, for example, will drive me crazy a little bit, okay? And I'm like, all right, I'm about to discipline you, man. But when I come at him with a heart of, uh, when, when I'm trying to discipline him, uh, when I'm frustrated or I'm coming at it with anger, there's not a lot of fruit that comes from that. It actually is discouraging. So when we are giving instruction and discipline, we got to make sure that the kids are walking away from that uh, feeling encouraged, actually. Although they've been called out, although maybe there's some punishment or restitution or whatever you say, uh, they will be encouraged by the uh, interaction because they're growing through it and they know that you love them unconditionally, even when they mess up. Let me just give you a a great word of encouragement because sitting just next to you on that sofa was an 11 year old boy who challenged like crazy. And if you don't kill them, they grow up and give you grandchildren. So just hold on. Better days are coming, but I, it really wasn't that bad, but there were seasons where all of our kids were like that, but especially this one. Anyway, he's, he knows that's true. It's worth it. But I, I want to kind of add to what you said, not you said it great, but in this thought as well, inside, especially men, there's this thing who wrote the book called wild at heart. Um, John Eldridge, it's, it's inside men to be adventurous and to try things and to be a little bit rowdy. Okay. God made us that way. That's our spirit. So you have to handle them in such a way that breaks their will, but not their spirit. Because you want to keep that adventurous spirit of wonder and let them ask questions, but teach them how to do it in an honoring way. As Amy and I said, in our family, we had the big three. And one of them was honoring other people. That includes your, your parents as well or any authority or, and just general people in general. So you can ask questions and be adventurous and be curious without being dishonoring. And so you're going to battle. That's normal. It's part of what God created in them. And even as pre-hormone seasons, and even during the teenage years, they're going to have that inside them. So just make sure there's the spirit of honor so that you don't break their spirit, but you break their will to circumvent you as authority. Yeah. All right. Next question. We try and try and keep going back to old patterns of arguing and communicating. How do you permanently change that? a tough one. Communication. Anybody? Old patterns. Um, I'll share a little bit. Um, going back, well, first and foremost, it's, you have to seek the Lord. 
um, and really seek with a heart change, with expecting a heart change. Because that's what, what's happening is we're not getting to the root of what's, what keeps surfacing. And so if we keep going back to old patterns, if we keep going back to the um, negative communication or whatever's causing friction you know, in your household or it, with your spouse, it's because there's something that's still being undealt with. And so getting to the root of what that problem is is going to help. That's, I mean, we need to do that um, so that we can move forward and communicating in the way that God tells us to communicate and honoring one another, you know, going back to making sure we're honoring each other. And so those old patterns, it's not one person over the other. You're, you, when it, a counselor told Willie and I one time, yes, we go to counseling. A counselor told Willie and I one time is that we're, we have to fight shoulder to shoulder, not face to face. Because we're not fighting one another, we're fighting together against what the enemy is trying to come and bring attacks in our home with. And so to, to be able to break those old patterns is making sure that we're dealing with the root cause of whatever is surfacing every time. And so that's the only way that you're going to be able to change and permanently change for the good is seeking the Lord in that and, and being obedient, listening to his voice and being obedient to what, ha- what he says. Because at the end of the day, we do have to die to ourselves. We can't come at it selfishly. And maybe that's, that's the root of it is that we have two selfish people trying to come in and get our way. And we have to remember that we have to die to ourselves and honor one another and respect one another. And wait, I'm going to be quiet in this moment. And what is the Lord telling me to do? What, what is he, how is he telling me to be? And so that's the only way that we're going to be able to break those old patterns, I okay. think. You know, that's so good. I, I, I want to I, I wanna bring some understanding to something. I just had a conversation with someone the other day about this. And in this question is, we keep arguing and communicating. And I would tell you that we misunderstand what communication means. Uh, communication is not talking. That's just the sharing of an idea a sharing of an opinion, the sharing of a POV. Communicating is when you share and people receive. Okay, so you have to take the onus of responsibility that just because I say something doesn't mean I'm communicating. So how do I fashion this? How do I say this in a way that they can receive it? And so what that means is, If all you do is just share your point, I can't believe you did this and this hurt me and you shouldn't do that. Well, I'm not saying that you shouldn't share that information, but that's not communication. That's just talking. And you need to share it in such a way that they can understand. How do you do that? By not being so defensive or on the attack, really, should I say. Because when you come in on the attack, then they're just going to rise up. If Amy were frustrated at something I'm doing and she came and said, Randy, you do this and it's wrong and you shouldn't say it that way anymore. Well, I'm going to bow up. Right, right. But, and then that's not communication. We've just, or talking. We're yelling and it's going to escalate really fast. But if she came and said, Randy, at the right time, timing is everything. Okay. And sometimes you can't share when things are at an emotional all time high. And people misunderstand the scripture that says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Right, right. Yeah. If that's the case, then there would have been weeks where we wouldn't have gotten any sleep at all. Right. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> Some of you guys, maybe you'll get that later. But, um, but it just means that in your heart, you have to work that out. Because it may not be good to try to solve something today because emotions are at an all-time high. So timing is, is important. And you come back and you go, okay, when this happened... This is how I took it. Help, help me understand. Oh, now all of a sudden we're communicating and you can never solve a problem in any relationship without communication. That's right. And you can't have communication unless there's the giving and receiving of information and ideas. Right. So that will help you uh, change patterns of communication. So, okay, we need to close up. Amy, would you pray for our, our families in our church? Heavenly Father, we come to you right now, Lord Jesus, and I I just thank you for who you are. I thank you that we are sons and daughters of you, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Father, that you are all we need. Father, you are enough, Lord Jesus, in whatever situation we might be in right now. I just pray, Lord God, that we feel your presence. 
Lord Jesus, that you lead us and you guide us as just our shepherd, Lord God, in the good days and in the bad days, Lord God, that we feel your presence and you refine us into who you are creating us to be. I pray, Lord God, that you give us patience that you give us hope for a future, Lord God, that you just give us supernatural wisdom as we're raising our families, Lord God. I thank you, Father, that in this room, there are people that may feel like they don't have any hope, but I thank you that nothing is impossible with you. I thank you that when we are weak, you are strong. And I pray, Lord God, that you show yourself faithful to your people, Lord God, that you protect the children in our lives, Lord God, and that you be all that we need. We thank you for that. And we thank you for this day in Jesus' name, amen. With your eyes still closed and heads bowed for just a moment, uh, or in a couple of minutes, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna leave. But this is the most important part of the service. So I'm just gonna ask you, let's stay reverent for a moment, because now is an opportunity for people that are not in right relationship with God, for them to respond to that. And kind of what I'd like for us to understand is eternity is in the balance right now. And people's lives are gonna be changed from eternally separated from God to in right relationship with him. And, and sometimes we can distract that. And so for just a couple of minutes, please, how many of you are here right now and you know you're not in relationship with God? And God doesn't want to have transactions with you. He wants to have relationship with you. And if you're going to have healthy relationships, it begins with right relationship with the Lord. So if that's you, I'm just gonna lead us in a prayer in a moment. And a prayer simply is just helping us turn our hearts towards God because that's what he wants. If you've never done that before, or maybe you have, but something's happened and you're distant from God in a moment, I'm gonna lead us in a prayer to do that. And if you want to be included in that prayer, on the count of three, I'm gonna count to three and you raise your hand just as a sign of saying, yes, I need to be right with God. I know that's missing. I know I'm not right with him. I'm gonna lead us in that prayer. If that's you, number one, uh, go ahead, get ready to raise your hand. Number two, please don't, don't let this day pass you by. Today is the day of salvation three. If that's you, raise your hands wherever you are saying, I need that. That's right. Come on, right there where you are. Lift your hand up to the Lord. It's really, that's an act of you turning your heart towards the Lord. In fact, he sees your heart, not just your hand. Okay. You can put your hands down. Everybody pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. You paid the price that I couldn't pay. And you did that because you want relationship with me. So today, I pivot. I turn my life towards you. Forgive me of my sin. My life is yours. I believe in my heart. I confess with my mouth. Jesus, you are my Lord. You my Savior. You my number one. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give God some praise for what he did here today? Yeah.